Hello and welcome to my favourite time of the year, the big longevity summary video of 2024, biased massively by what I read myself, slash think is most interesting and important. As usual, I've broken the papers and topics into sections so that you can easily jump around, but I advise not doing so as I think all parts are interesting. Now, since I'm living in Japan, where the induced pluripotent stem cell research was conducted by Shinya Yamanaka, what better place to start the video than with stem cells, those cells of interest due to their ability to keep on dividing, but also to turn into specialised cells. What Yamanaka famously discovered was a way to convert specialised cells back into stem cells by expressing four genes, the Yamanaka factors, that refers to what happens in development. And actually, this first paper I show is work primarily conducted in Osaka and Kyoto, induced pluripotent stem cell-derived corneal epithelium for transplant surgery, a single-arm, open-label, first-in-human interventional study in Japan. In the study, they used human-induced pluripotent stem cells to create corneal epithelial cell sheets that they could then use as a regenerative medicine approach to treat limbal stem cell deficiency. What you're watching now is the procedure, sorry, perhaps I should have warned you, but it has so far caused no adverse offence to the patients, and this was for two years. After one year, they already noticed that the cornea had become less opaque and it corrected distance visual acuity. A larger clinical trial is planned to further investigate the efficacy of this procedure. Truly eye-opening. But where do these stem cells come from? Well, in Japan, they've now established a clinical-grade haplobank, which matches approximately 40% of the Japanese population, so that they can easily use these as a resource for regenerative medicine approaches. But it turns out getting human-induced pluripotent stem cells may actually be possible from humans of any age. In this study, they showed that stem cells derived from centenarians and their children can be used to make a longevity-specific bank of induced pluripotent stem cells. This groundbreaking study has created a valuable tool for investigating the mechanisms of healthy ageing and resilience to age-related diseases, potentially leading to new therapeutic strategies for promoting longevity. Another interesting human clinical trial using stem cells was conducted this year, but this time, instead of using induced pluripotent stem cells from a biobank, they were using an alternative approach but the patient's own cells. This paper, Transplantation of Chemically Induced Pluripotent Stem Cell Derived Islets Under Abdominal Anterior Rectus Sheath in a Type 1 Diabetes Patients, as it states, used chemically induced pluripotent stem cells. So instead of the gene expression approach using Yamanaka factors, labs have previously found a suite of chemicals that they can treat cells with to achieve the same effect so-called chemically induced pluripotent stem cells. I won't go into full detail of how exactly they achieve this with the chemicals as I have a full video on it already, but you can break it down into four steps where you change the chemical competition in the media that inhibit or activate different biological pathways within the cell. So instead, let's look at that application. This study published reported successful transplantation of these chemically induced stem cells in a type 1 diabetes patient. It builds upon work that they previously published in non-human primates. Following this introduction of stem cells, the patient achieved insulin independence 75 days post-transplantation and had significantly improved glycemic control. Now the very cool thing about this is that it's also autologous. So this diagram shows how they took the adipose-derived mesenchymal stromal cells from the patient converted them to induced pluripotent stem cells, differentiated them into islet-like cells, and then could inject them back into the same patient. So of course, this also helps to ameliorate any immune rejection. Now, it's worth considering whether there is an advantage of chemical versus Yamanaka factor-based reprogramming, but uh, right now, I don't really have an opinion. Now, we'll stick with human clinical trials just for a little bit longer, and this time we will consider the skin. In this paper, the use of ectopic fuller fibroblasts to modify skin identity, they took fibroblasts from the sole of the patient's feet and injected them into the thigh and observed increased thickening of the skin. 
In other words, the identity of the thigh tissue was changed to match more the skin seen on your feet. While here they were interested in applying this technique to increase skin thickness in patients who have tissue stumps following amputation, this concept of changing identity, or in other words, a form of cellular reprogramming, could be applied to old versus young tissue. Perhaps my imagination is too broad, but I do think that the questions that this paper raises is very important. But let's now move from skin to the ovaries. Again. What do you do, Nancy? I research improving fertility rates in ageing by studying mice. Ever do weddings? I do, but not for the mice, of course. With the mice, we're reconstituting young and old eggs to boost fertility. I should have asked you to do this one. They did. did. Here I am. But my research is all about improving fertility rates. Wish you hadn't turned it down. I didn't. I didn't. In fact, we were able to improve life birth <laughs> rates fourfold in aged mice. And it's true. While Colin may be the god of sex, fertility is known to the climb of age, and a groundbreaking study by researchers at the National University of Singapore demonstrated this year that aged oocytes can be rejuvenated by transplanting them into a young follicular environment, as you can see here. This process improved mitochondrial function, reduced chromosomal abnormalities, and quadrupled life birth rates in mice. The importance of the environment for the eggs aligns well with another fascinating discovery. Many of the proteins in the ovaries are exceptionally long-lived. A study published in eLife revealed that ovaries contain an extremely high number of long-lived proteins, more than other tissues, and even more than the brain. These stable proteins are found not only in the eggs themselves, but also in other somatic cells in the ovary. And many of these long-lived proteins have protective functions, such as repairing DNA or protecting cells from damage. Interestingly, the concentration of many long-lived proteins in the ovary and egg cells decrease of age. This gradual disappearance of long-lived proteins from the ovaries and eggs may explain why fertility declines in female mammals after a certain age, and collectively provides new insights into the mechanisms of reproductive ageing and offer potentially and offers potential avenues for developing treatments to address age-related fertility issues in humans. So the research on both oocyte rejuvenation and long-lived proteins in ovaries could pave the way for innovative fertility treatments, potentially extending the reproductive lifespan of women or improving the success rates of assisted reproductive technologies. But what exactly is ageing? Now, of course, we have the hallmarks of ageing that give us a framework to discuss processes linked with ageing, but still, what is it? Well, unfortunately to disappoint, it seems the top leaders in the field of longevity cannot agree on this answer either. A comprehensive survey conducted by Fadim Gladyshev and colleagues published this year revealed significant disagreements among researchers on fundamental aspects of ageing and highlighted ongoing challenges in defining ageing, its causes, when it begins, underscoring the complexity of the field. However, Gladi Shev says, the vast diversity of responses reflects the many unknowns in the field. He expects rapid advances in efforts to define ageing, including the development of biomarkers to track biological age. It's a time of opportunity. But that said, there were a few papers that tried to address this question of why we age this year. I covered one paper discussing the non-linearity of ageing, where they identified key shifts in molecular markers at around 44 and 60 years of age, linking these more dramatic changes to immune regulation, metabolism and disease risk. To do this, they used advanced multi-omics profiling, and it challenges the traditional view of ageing as being a linear process, suggesting that significant physiological shifts occur at specific ages. At the same time, another paper came out describing a proteomic ageing clock where they could see which proteins were changing with age and then use that information to infer on the ageing process. They found that proteins contributing most substantially to the proteomic age clock were involved in numerous biological functions, including extracellular matrix interactions, immune responses and inflammation, hormone regulation and reproduction, neuronal structure and function, and development and differentiation. Clearly quite a few processes. But as I discussed in that video, both these papers raise more questions than they address. But it's worth noting that immune regulation pops up in both papers, and that is why we will look next.
Now, let's start with this paper. IgG is an aging factor that drives adipose tissue fibrosis and metabolic decline. In this study, they found that the accumulation of IgG antibodies drives tissue fibrosis and impairs metabolic health in mice. Interestingly, they found that caloric restriction was found to decrease this age-linked IgG accumulation, suggesting a potential mechanism for the anti-aging effects of dietary interventions. And in continuation of this theme, another study came out this year, Spatial Transcriptomic Landscape Unfells Immunoglobulin-Associated Senescence as a Hallmark of Aging, where it turns out that it's not just the adipose tissue, but perhaps many tissues where we can see this deposition. And in this paper, they correlated that deposition with the presence of senescent cells, or senescent sensitive spots, they call them. At least that appears to be the conclusion of this mammoth paper that performed spatial transcriptomics on several mouse tissues. So this suggests that these self-recognising antibodies are bad, at least in terms of ageing. But can we also use antibodies for lifespan extension, so-called anti-ageing antibodies? Well, perhaps we can. This paper that came out earlier this year showed that antibody-mediated depletion of myeloid-based hematopoietic stem cells can protect against age-associated immune dysfunction in mice. So this study actually builds upon a, a wealth of previous data. In young mice, there is a balance between two types of blood stem cells, each of which feeds into a different arm of the immune system. The adaptive arm that produces antibodies and T-cells targeted to specific pathogens, and the innate arm that produces broad responses such as inflammation to infection. And it seems with age, there's a bias and a shift towards this latter innate arm. So the researchers decided to create antibodies that could bind to these blood stem cells to deplete them and enhance the abundance of the adaptive arm. And following this treatment, they were able to restore the immune system of mice and also reduced inflammation. So we've just seen how antibodies can be deployed to reduce cells, but they can also be used to deplete protein levels. Scientists discovered that inhibiting the protein interleukin-11 can significantly increase the healthy lifespan of mice. This breakthrough came from a study published in Nature, which showed that the inhibition of interleukin-11 signaling through antibody treatment could extend both the health span and lifespan. In fact, treatment of these antibodies from 75 weeks of age extended their median lifespan by 22.4% in males and 25% in females. And not only did these mice live longer, but they also showed reduced incidence of cancer and other age-related diseases, demonstrating an improvement in overall health. Now, in contrast to these quite large changes in lifespan, this more recent paper, Lithocholic Acids, LCA, Phenocopy's Anti-Aging Effects of Calorie Restriction, also showed some consistent, albeit non-significant, increases in median lifespan for mice. And this is when the mice were given LCA from one year of age. But speaking of lifespan studies, it's time that we look at the latest updates from the Interventions Testing Programme. As you can see from this table, the most of the results that were published this year are not that exciting. The results show that 16-alpha hydroxyestriol and canagliflozin had the most significant positive effects on male lifespan, but some of them had negative effects on female lifespan. And unfortunately, this mentality matches this final article, Implausibility of Radical Life Extension in Humans in the 21st Century. This work tries to reconcile the previous radical improvements made in human lifespan following improved public health and medicine to the much slower changes seen today and raises the question, how much longer are humans capable of living? And as said in the title, they suggest that it's implausible that there would be radical life extension seen in this century. Now, the ITP results combined with this latter study seems like a negative way to end. And honestly, I don't understand the maths enough here to fully understand how realistic these predictions are but I see it instead as a new challenge and a reminder that we do need to work smarter and more ambitious on longevity. And combined with what I know, of which of course I cannot fit into a single video, I myself remain optimistic 
and hope to contribute more academically in the future. So there you have it, my very biased views on longevity research in 2024, which no doubt missed many, 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 many papers. I'm truly sorry if I missed your research, and so therefore, please comment below what I did miss. And with that, there's only one final thing to say, which is Happy New Year.